Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Friends of Bangladeshi. Each time we bring a very special friend who has been a friend of the community or the country. And today is no exception. Before I introduce him, let's go and see a video clip on him. Jim Fitzpatrick MP is a British Labour Party politician. Born and raised in Glasgow, he moved to London in 1973. In 1974, he became a firefighter with the London Fire Brigade and was awarded the Fire Brigade Long Service and Good Conduct Medal after 20 years of service. On 1st May 1997, Jim was elected Member of Parliament for Poplar and Canning Town. He acted as Minister of State for Farming and the Environment and Under Secretary for the State of Transport, Department of Trade and Industry and Deputy Prime Minister Office. Additionally, he acted as Government Whip, Minister for London and Vice Chamberlain for Her Majesty's Household. Jim regularly maintains his surgery for local residents, the majority of which are of Bangladeshi origin and is known for speaking Bangla in many Bangladeshi events, a trend now followed by many other MPs. We have just seen a video clip on our very special guest. Now, I introduce him to you. He's none other than Mr. Jim Fitzpatrick, MP for Poplar and Limehouse. Welcome to our studio. Thank you so much. Thank you. When were you born? Where were you born? Born in Glasgow in Scotland in 1952. So long time ago, 66 time. years ago. And then you moved to London. Yeah, 73, 45 years ago. So 45 I've been a Londoner for 45 years. Okay. I did uh, 23 years in London Fire Brigade and I've been an MP for 21 years. And then you joined, um, I think in 1974, the Fire Brigade? Yes. Okay. And was in the fire service until 1997. 1997. When I was elected to Parliament. Parliament. And during that time, you received an honour, medal for your long service well, with if, the Fire Brigade? Well, anyone who stays in the Fire Brigade for more than 20 years and doesn't get into serious trouble, mm -hmm. uh, there is a, a, a medal that we all receive, okay. our long service and good conduct medal. So I was lucky enough to receive one of those from the, the Chief Fire Officer, yes. Sure. When did you first get involved with politics? Uh, I've always been political. I um, helped start my own first political party at school when I was 16. Um, I've always been a member, um, active member of a political party. Um, I joined the Labour Party in 1983 in London and have been active in the party since then. Since then. And then you stood for uh, Parliament. Yes. From which constituency? For Poplar and, Poplar and Canning Town, as it was then. then. But then there were boundary changes in 2010 to create Poplar and Limehouse uh -huh. after the Boundary Commission changed the uh, geo geo uh, geography of all the constituencies in the country. So Poplar and Canning Town to start, now Poplar and Limehouse. Limehouse. And first attempt, you became an MP. Yes. Yes. And Poplar and Limehouse is in East London, isn't it? Yes, in Tower Hamlets. Tower Hamlets. I yes. did try to become the MP for Barking in 1993, but 19... I didn't get selected as the candidate. So uh, I see. Margaret Hodge uh, beat me to that seat. So <laughs> I learned the lessons from Margaret and how to be selected as a candidate and successfully deployed those tactics in 1995 in Poplar. Yeah. 1997. 2001, 2005, 2010, 2015, 2017. 17, six, six times. times. So that is tremendous, <laughs> tremendous achievement. And um, during that period, you held many positions, high positions. I, uh, I held a number of uh, positions in government from uh, Senior Whip, Vice Chamberlain of Her Majesty's Household, mm -hmm. when I was the, the contact uh, between Her Majesty, Buckingham Palace, and the House of Commons. Then I was a minister in local government, uh, in environment, uh, in, food. In, in, in employment, in transport, uh, and in uh, food farming and environment. So, minister in Quite four different number. departments, yeah. <laughs> Um, and many committees, parliamentary committees. Uh, I was a member of two select committees and I, I now chair six all-party parliamentary groups. So every MP is very busy in different ways and I'm mm. no, no different, yeah? No different, yeah. How many times have you visited Bangladesh? Uh, only five times. When was the last time you visited? 2010. When was the first visit? 1998, 
I guess it was the 50th anniversary of the foundation of the Awami League. I was there okay. as the Labour Party representative because mm. Awami League was our is our sister party. Sister party. And then the other yeah. visits were on p personal grounds or individual grounds uh -huh. um, rather than party political uh, activities. And when you were a minister, did you visit? No, no, never went as a minister. So next time? I was, I was there whilst I was a minister, but it was a private visit. I wasn't private. there representing Her Majesty's government. I was there on a personal visit, um, but I was a minister at the time. Sometimes it's, it's difficult for some people to differentiate. You visited Silet? Four of the five times. Four of the five times. Uh, and I'm patron of the uh, village orphanage at Gazipur. Gazipur, um, Shishi, yeah. uh, Shishipoli Plus. Yes. The Sripur yes. village orphanage. Sripur, yeah, yeah. Um, so I uh, visited there a couple of times. Um, Tommy Mia, the Tommy, Bangla yeah. chef. Uh, Tommy Mia introduced my wife and I to the uh, village Sripur. orphanage. Um, Sheila, my wife, is now a trustee of the orphanage. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm a patron of the orphanage. So... We have run a number of uh, fundraising charity dinners. That's Sripur, isn't Sripur, it? Sripur, yes. Yeah, because we had Trisha here, and we we are um, waiting to get pet car. Pet car, right, yes. very good, yeah. Yes. Well, we had a charity fundraising dinner at the House of Commons two, three months ago in July. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I beg your pardon, back in uh, February, March, and we raised £19,000 in one night for the village orphanage, which was a great effort by yes. everybody concerned. So uh, we do what we can to support the village orphanage. When you visited Silet, did you go to different villages? I couldn't remember them all, <laughs> but many villages. And then yeah. in many of the villages we visited, people came out and said, you're Jim Fitzpatrick, you're my MP. I'm visiting my family from from Poplar or from my land or from Bromley by Bow. So, uh, because each time you give a speech, you say something in Bengali, don't you? I, I know a little bit of Sileti, not Bengali, a little bit of Sileti. Sileti. So, so do you write it down and read it or do you I have, say it from I, your I memory? I have it in my head. Can you say something? Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum I'm a nam Jim Fitzpatrick. Petra. I'm a goto Beshi Bosa Doria MP Poplar Limehouse. I'm a Shahori of Nara Balasoin. My Foria Diba. I'm a Tura Tura Seleti Matsum Fari. Tura Tura Seleti Matsum Fari. Banglanai Seleti Matsum Fari. Beshinai. Not much. Can see I'm a Hikram and I'm a Hunram. I'm sure you are aware of, of the development of Bangladesh. Sure. It has just come out of the, as a, as a uh, um, from least developed country to a grow, growing country. Yes. What do you think of that? Well, I've been to a couple of events with the Bangladeshi High Commissioner here in London to celebrate the fact that Bangladesh's status is changing. Bangladeshi growth has been around 6% yeah. for most of the last many, 10 years, many years yes. which is um, phenomenal. In Britain, we would, we would grab 6%. <laughs> We're lucky if we can get to 2%. So Bangladesh has been developing and growing significantly for the last decade. So it's no surprise that it's moving in UN and World Health Organization status up the international league table, which is to the great credit of the Bangladeshi people, of Bangladeshi commerce, industry and agriculture, and of course the Bangladeshi government. Also addressing pro poverty. Absolutely. I think it's doing, um, it's an iconic country, isn't it? It is, yeah. um, it is occasionally described as the tiger economy of the tiger. region. Yes. Just like Singapore and Hong Kong used to be the tiger economies. Mm -hmm. Now the focus is shifting to that part of Asia and Bangladesh mm -hmm. is the driver in, uh, get, in showing the way. Thank you for your support. Well, the whole the Bangladeshi community get. in the UK and in other countries Mm -hmm. must look back fondly and be very proud of what Bangladesh is achieving. Mm -hmm. And of course, the Bangladeshi community here is helping because they are sending remittances, remittances. back. They are supporting family and friends and business and property. So it is a collective effort of all the Bangladeshi community in different countries right around the world. Mm -hmm. But it's been driven by Bangladesh itself. Yeah. You have been involved with environment and Bangladesh is a victim. Sure. Bangladesh is not getting the help it should have got. Then we have the disruption from United States, Trump. What is your opinion about it? Is the world doing enough? Well, the world has set itself targets to combat climate change. 
And we've seen in the UK over the summer the, the world's atmosphere, the world's um, temperature is changing. Recent weeks. How much that is down to uh, humanity, it's very difficult to gauge. I don't think there's any doubt that it is a contributory factor. But the records don't go, far, go, go back far enough to say that it's all man-made. Some of it may very well be the rotation of the Earth. Some of it may be the wobble of the Earth. Some of it may be sunspots. But humanity is contributing. Therefore, we need to be sensitive to what we are doing in part of our lives in contributing to emissions and to, to climate change. Um, Bangladesh is one of the most vulnerable countries um, and the least change in, in the climate of the world raises sea levels and Bangladesh is very much in the front line and vulnerable to that. So we need to be conscious of that. And we need to try and make sure we have international treaties yes, to try and get the Paris climate Accord. emissions down. Paris Accord is broken now, isn't it? Well, it's, um, it's stalled, at least. Um, but the government, certainly the UK and the EU and other countries, still have targets. Even, even President Trump is recognising that there has to be um, some <laughs> human activity. And, and in that instance, we've not given up on that. Uh -huh. Five to 600,000 Bangladesh, British Bangladeshis living in this country. And majority of them are in Tower Hamlets. And that includes your constituency. My constituency is probably 15 to 20 percent Bangladeshi, yes. What would be in numbers? Between 15 and 20,000. 15 and 20,000. On the Bethel Green side, there are more, bigger Excellent. concentration. So what do you think of the progress the Bangladeshi community is making? Uh, educational performance, for example, of young people. Um, it has changed hugely. 20 years ago, educational performance of Tower Hamlet schools was on the floor. Um, now it is as good, if not better, than most schools in the country. So let me just turn this off. We'll continue the discussion. Let's go for a short break. Okay. We'll be back soon. Welcome back. We were talking about the Bangladeshi community in this country as well as in your constituency and yes. surrounding areas. So please carry on. You were saying. Well, if you look at the educational performance in Tower Hamlet schools 20 years ago, the results were on the floor and they were just not very good. But new teachers, new heads, new governors, good parental involvement. Um, kids demonstrating they wanted to learn, including the Bangladeshi kids, who perform uh, the biggest concentration of pupils and students in our schools. Our education exam results are now above the national average, demonstrating that our children are as smart as kids anywhere else in the country. And our kids are going on to university, to college, to apprenticeships in huge numbers, much bigger than ever before. In that instance, it demonstrates the contribution that the Bangladeshi community is making to education and in future to employment and to UK POC. So I think the Bangladeshi community can be proud of what's it achieved economically as well as educationally. But there are problems. There are social problems, housing problems, problems re relating to young people. Sure. So what do you think about all these issues, you know? There are lots of people trying to address all of those issues. Um, Tower Hamlets has got the biggest um, number of social homes of any local authority in the whole of London um, over the past few years. So the council is working hard, housing associations are, are working hard. The schools are doing as best they can educationally in terms of drugs, in terms of violence, in terms of antisocial behaviour. The police and the council are doing everything they can to help. There's lots but there of are no, not many polices. 
Uh, well, I don't think it's necessarily just about how many police. It's about parents controlling their kids. It's about young people behaving themselves. Nobody forces young people to engage in antisocial behaviour. Nobody forces young people to engage in drug activity. Nobody forces young people to engage in violence. And um, that's personal responsibility. That's down to the children. It's down to the parents. It's down to, to peer pressure. It's not just down to the authorities, and in that instance... No, no, not just down to authorities, but, for instance, housing, overcrowding, and um, then the anti-social behaviour, you know, definitely, you know, there has to be law inform enforcement agencies, you know, doing their job. Yeah, and the first, thing, the first thing that parents do when their kids are arrested and charged yeah. is to scream... And that this is wholly inappropriate. They have a responsibility to look after their kids. The they kids are. have a responsibility doing, yeah. to behave. But equally, we do need enough police. We do need enough housing. It's a balanced responsibility from society and the agencies that society creates, as well as for the individual and for families and for communities. Mm -hmm. Nobody gets off scot-free in this. There is no pass in this. Mm -hmm. Everybody has to make sure they're doing their job. And we all need to make sure that we all do everything we can, can. to try and keep our young people on the straight and narrow. That's young white kids, young black kids, as well as young people from the Bangladeshi community. It doesn't discriminate. There are kids in each community which are being pulled in different ways to misbehave, and we've got to try and stop that. Let's talk about something different. Okay. The curry industry. All right, yeah. Uh, the backbone of the Bangladeshi community is the curry industry. It is suffering tremendously. We have got... Um, at least 30, 40,000 vacancies in restaurants. We cannot bring staff. You can bring staff with high salary, some 32,000 or so, but if you do takeaways in that restaurant, you cannot get a license. And the takings are so low. Younger generation, they are not interested in the catering industry, working odd hours. Parents are encouraging them to diversify to go into universities, becoming doctors, and so on and so forth. So this 4.2 billion pound industry yeah. is dying. What is your opinion? What can we do? Um, we have been... In the first instance, I don't think the industry is dying. I think that's false. Uh, I think it's fake news. Um, the industry should have been investing in training um, for the last 10, 15 years in the good days. Tommy Mia, who is a personal friend of mine, Bangladesh chef, Tommy has been lobbying the industry to set up its own training college for the over 10 years now. The industry hasn't done that. The industry hasn't asked me or Rishanara Ali and others to go to the Department of Industry and say, can you give us any support for a college, for a training industry, for a training initiative? And importing chefs, importing staff is short-sighted. It's never going to work. But. If, no buts. If, people, if you want people to work in your industry, you create good conditions and you pay decent wages and you will attract the staff. If you pay poor wages and poor conditions, you won't get the staff. That doesn't matter what the job is, whether the job is hospitality, whether it's hotel management, whether it's catering, whether it's cleaning. And um, When I came to London, I was driving a van. I was cleaning offices. In work, there is dignity. It doesn't matter what the work is. If you're working, you should be respected. Not everybody's going to be a doctor. Not everybody's going to be a lecturer. Not everybody's going to be a, a, a can lawyer. I, can or a I interrupt? I think I have been a caterer for four decades now. Yes. And what you were saying, I differ. For instance, you know, the working condition. The working condition is far better than in any other industry right now. And if you imagine, restaurants do not open lunchtime now. They open in the evening. Right. So altogether, he's working about 30 hours. Right. He's getting accommodation and a very high salary. But he has to work in the weekend. So that's the negative side. So... So, Mad, when I was in the fair brigade, I worked weekends pretty much every week. Yes, yeah, so... People okay. work shift All right. work. So you There's cannot say... wrong with shift work. You cannot say that working conditions are bad. Working condition was bad, but now Improving. it has improved. Okay. It has improved tremendously. So it's the same and, as any secondly, job. It's secondly, the same as any job. You have to sell it to young yeah. people. 
You cannot say to young people, do this job without saying, what's in it for me? What the are the conditions? What are the wages? What is the future? What is the career yeah. opportunity? And it you doesn't, know, it you doesn't said, matter what the job it, is. When I said the industry is dying, yes. you said it's fake news. It's not like that. I am a witness. There is statistics that three to four restaurants a week is closing down. Right. We had 12,000 businesses, but now it's less than 10,000. And I, each year it's declining. Well, I think that's the same malaise as is affecting the whole high street. Online shopping, um, online eateries are having the same effect on restaurants as they're having on the high street shops because people are ordering takeaways, people are ordering online. And that's affecting restaurants the same as affecting Marks and Spencers yeah. or Tesla's. Then, okay, if the restaurant is suffering, how about the takeaways? Our takeaways who do deliveries, they cannot find stuff either. Then they need to look to themselves. If they're not profitable, they need to look at the profit margins. They need to look at how they make sure the business at, is profitable. At, at Channel S, we are trying to do everything we can. Uh, we have a program, it's called Catering Circle. We have been to various parts of the country. Right. We have identified the problems, the negative sides, uh, adopting to new uh, eating habits, sure. healthy foods, technology, and so on. Yeah. So we are doing our bit. The organizations within the catering industry, uh, like Bangladesh Caterers Association, yeah. they are doing as well. And there is a parliamentary curry committee as well. So everyone is doing their bit. but. The curry industry, the, it is the British curry industry. It's not Bangladeshi or Indian. But and the majority of it is Bangladeshi, certainly in England. No, no, run by Bangladeshis, yes. but it is the British curry now. Yes. Because it is different from what it is back in Indian subcontinent. Yes. It is adapted to our clientele, uh, their taste. So things are happening. But the reality, the fact of the matter is uh, pre-Brexit, we were told that we'll be helped. Who by? By various politicians. Not this one. No, not this one. <laughs> okay. And um, because Commonwealth would be revived and then, you know, you can bring staff and so on. Well, and I so think forth. that was false promises. Yeah, false promises. So... You know, we are in a vicious circle now. Well, the BCA recommended Brexit because they believed the promises that shutting believe down, the, shutting down Eastern right. European immigration yeah. will open up Commonwealth immigration. Yeah. Um, I don't know who told you that. It certainly wasn't me. Some, certainly wasn't <laughs> the Labour Party. Uh, I think you were conned there. Yeah. <laughs> so the but notwithstanding that, there is still an issue. And it's a genuine issue how to make sure that you can recruit staff for the British curry industry, which is so important to the UK high street and to the British economy and to British, uh, British people who so want to eat curry. we are running out of time. OK. And I want to uh, talk about briefly on Brexit. Right. What do you think of the future of this country, future of uh, the Commonwealth? I think that um, we will probably have to take five to 10 years, maybe even 20 years to look back and see what the real impact of Brexit is. After the referendum in 2016, uh, if you looked at um, all the indicators, the pound plummeted, shares plummeted, um, but within 12 months, the pound was back up to its pre-referendum value. Shares are higher than they were before. So the markets fluctuate all the time. Um, I think you will have to take time after Brexit to look back and see what the impact was. There are people on both sides saying Brexit will be fine or Brexit will be a disaster. It's, it's impossible to tell what it's going to be. It's impossible until the government finish negotiating to, to look at what the deal is going to be to see whether Parliament approves it. It's going to be far too early to tell whether it will be a good move or a bad are, move. Are you in favour of soft Brexit, hard Brexit M or no deal? My, uh, my conclusion as a Democrat is that Parliament said to the British people, you decide. The British people voted to leave the European Union. Mm -hmm. My line is that I respect the decision of the British people. Therefore, I support 
us leaving the European Union. I would prefer a softer Brexit. I voted in campaign Remain. I would prefer us not to leave. But the people said they want to leave. Therefore, I think we should but leave. But if there is a vote tomorrow, majority of the people are going to say stay. No, I don't think so. Okay. Any election where there has been a close vote, when it was put to the people afterwards, try again, they voted by bigger numbers to support the first decision. I think if the British people had mm -hmm. a second referendum, they may very well say we'll go out by a bigger margin. Mm -hmm. There's no guarantee on this. People are saying more people would vote Remain. Maybe they would, maybe they wouldn't. It is speculation. There's not, I don't think there's going to be a second referendum. There may be, but I don't think there will be. Thank you, Jim, for coming to the studio. It has been a very interesting discussion. Viewers, as usual, we bring very special guests on our program. And today has been no exception. Stay with us. We'll be back soon. Thank you. <laughs>